This is an introduction to stability and control flight testing. This material comes out of the textbook in chapter 19. In order to perform its intended mission, an aircraft must have adequate stability and control. But depending on the mission, you may need high stability or high control. For example, transport aircraft need to be highly stable for a smooth ride. Fighter aircraft, on the other hand, need to be highly controllable for combat maneuvering. Regulations depend on the type of aircraft. For light aircraft, the FAA uses CFR Part 23. Light aircraft is any aircraft with 19 or less passengers and a maximum certified takeoff weight of 19,000 pounds or less. Airplanes are further categorized level 1 through 4 depending on the actual number of passengers. They're also categorized at different performance levels depending on their speeds. You can see the subparagraphs controllability, trim, stability, etc. for the different stability control subcategories. For transport aircraft, the FAA uses CFR Part 25. Again, you can see the subparagraphs listed for the various subcategories of stability and control. For military aircraft, there's a couple of references. One is MIL F8785, and another is MIL Standard 1797. 1797 is currently has a Rev B, but that's not available for public release distribution unlimited. You can, however, get 1797A shown here that was released in the 1990s. When dealing with stability control, we have to consider a reference axis system. The first one is the earth or inertial axis system, also referred to as northeast down. And the origin of this axis can be really any point on the earth. But we really want a body axis system something that moves along with the aircraft, that rotates with the aircraft, that accelerates with the aircraft. This system, its origin is at the center of gravity. The X body axis points out the nose, Y body out the right wing, and Z body down, and we use the right hand rule. This is good for defining locations of aircraft parts, calculating moments of inertia, and dealing with non-vector thrust. We can relate the body axis system to the earth or inertial system using these angles psi, theta, and phi with reference to the earth. We're going to assume that the earth is flat for this purpose. The stability axis system has the origin at the center of gravity and is basically the body axis system rotated through an angle of attack to align with the relative wind. However, there is no side slip. But the stability axis is, gives us a definition for angle of attack. It's the angle of the free stream air and the X body axis, and we give that symbol alpha. The wind axis system is the stability axis system, but rotated through an angle of side slip to align with the actual wind. This gives us beta, or side slip, and positive beta is defined as wind in the right ear. Lift and drag are aligned with the wind axis system. Now let's define some aerodynamic forces that act along the body axis system. C is the chord force and it acts along the X axis. Y is the side force acting along the Y axis. And N is the normal force acting along the Z axis. Some aerodynamic textbooks may have different aerodynamic forces defined and use different directions.
Next, we'll define moments. Rolling moment is given the symbol L. An aircraft rolls about the X body axis, and using the right hand rule, positive roll moment is shown with the direction in the figure. Pitching moment is given the symbol M, and that's moment about the Y body axis. Again, using the right hand rule, a positive pitching moment is shown in the diagram with nose up. Yawing moment is given the symbol N, its motion about the Z body axis, and once again using the right hand rule, a positive yawing moment is nose right as shown in the diagram. Next we'll find translational velocities. Positive velocities follow positive axes. Forward velocity or forward speed is given the symbol U. Side velocity or side speed is given V. And downward velocity is given W. Therefore the velocity of the center of gravity is the vector sum of the forward side and downward velocity components. True airspeed is the magnitude of the velocity of the CG and it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the forward side and downward velocity. We've already defined the moments L, M, and N. Now we'll look at what positive rotation rates P, Q, and R and how they're defined. P is roll rate, and it's defined positive again with the right hand rule. Q is pitch rate, positive with the right hand rule, so nose up. And R is yaw rate, positive with the right hand rule, nose right. So rotational rates P, Q, and R are in the same sense and direction as moments L, M, and N. Lift and drag can be resolved into the body axis system using angle of attack alpha, side slip beta, and some trig. These are the equations that show how you would resolve lift and drag into the body axis. We can define AOA in terms of forward speed and downward speed. In other words, alpha, or angle of attack, is the inverse tangent of W over U. We can also de define angle of side slip or beta, but we have to use V and true airspeed. One may be tempted to define beta as the inverse tangent of side speed over forward speed, but that's not correct. The correct definition is shown in the lower left corner as the inverse sine of V over V true. Here's the aerodynamic forces, moments, rates, and speeds all in one chart. For flight controls, we have to define a sign convention. Positive control deflections and forces produce negative surface deflections and cause positive moments about each axis with the one exception of ailerons. And for each individual control surface, trailing edge down or left in the case of rudder will be positive, even for ailerons. And I did want to note that not every platform or company or organization uses this same sign convention. So make sure in your organization you use their definitions for flight control and sign conventions. We'll walk through all of these here next. Longitudinal control deflections, positive pitch stick deflection and force is stick aft and causes a negative elevator deflection as we defined it, but positive pitching moment and positive pitch rate. Positive rudder pedal deflection and force is right pedal and it causes negative rudder deflection but positive yawing moment and positive yaw rate. 
lateral control definitions, positive roll stick deflection and force is stick right and causes positive composite aileron deflection, which we'll define on the next slide, but that will lead to positive rolling moment and positive roll rate. Positive aileron deflection either side is trailing edge down. So composite aileron deflection is defined with the following equation. It's left aileron minus right aileron divided by two. And again, this will produce a positive rolling moment and a positive roll rate. Next, we'll go over the equations of motion. They relate the applied forces and moments on an aircraft to the resulting response of the aircraft. For stability and control, we're describing the aircraft's dynamic response to control deflections, changes in thrust, and atmospheric disturbances. All the equations of motion are derived from Newton's second law. For translation, the sum of the forces equals the time derivative of linear momentum, and for rotation, the sum of the applied moments is the time derivative of angular momentum. Performance versus control. In aircraft performance, we want to focus on a point mass and really the translational force equations. So longitudinal is forward and back, lateral is left and right, vertical is up and down. Aircraft control, on the other hand, is more interested in the rotational or the moment equations about each of the axes. For longitudinal is pitch, lateral is roll, directional is yaw. Let's talk about forces and moments. In theory, there's a resultant force vector, script F, acting at the center of force, but that's hard to determine on an aircraft. Instead, we can de decompose that resultant force vector into an equivalent force, the same magnitude and direction, and an equivalent moment, both acting on the CG. The CG is something we can easily measure and know on an aircraft. When deriving the equations of motion, one has to know the underlying assumptions. First, the mass of the aircraft remains constant. Second, the aircraft is a rigid body. Third, the flat earth is what the inertial reference frame is. Fourth, the atmosphere is at rest relative to the inertial reference frame. And five, aircraft are symmetric about the X-body, Z-body plane. If any of these assumptions are violated, the following equations then cannot be applied. For the translational equations of motion, we use F equals MA. We assume constant mass, but we have to do the derivative of the velocity vector, and we have to use omega cross the velocity vector. When we do all that, we get three equations. Force in the x direction, force in the y direction, force in the z direction on the left-hand side, and the corresponding airplane response on the right-hand side. Again, we've defined u, v, w, q, r, previously. For the rotational equations of motion, we'll use the second part of Newton's law, which involves a moment and the derivative of angular momentum. You'll see in the bottom right hand corner the summary of the three equations. We get L, M, and N on the left hand side, and then we get various angular momentums and pitch rate, roll rate, and yaw rate but we're going to do some other notes to get a more usable set of equations on the next slide. We're going to use our mass moments of inertia and just to review there's moments of inertia and products of inertia. Moments of inertia are never zero. Products of inertia can be zero depending on if there's a plane of symmetry. So for conventional aircraft, we assume, again, that the aircraft is symmetric about the X-body, Z-body plane. And so we can see a lot of those derivatives will go to zero, and we'll end up with the simplified moment equations 
shown at the bottom. And there's kind of three sets of terms. There's angular acceleration component, gyroscopic precession, and inertia coupling. In the end, we end up with six degrees of freedom, aircraft equations of motion, three translational, three rotational. But we can reorder these six equations to form three longitudinal equations and three lateral directional equations. The longitudinal equations involve the x-force and the z-force and the m-moment. The lateral directional equations have the y-force, the l-moment, and the n-moment. These equations of motion are coupled and nonlinear. Unfortunately, there is no closed form solution. Again, just a reminder that fx, fy, fz, lm, and n are forces and moments generated by aerodynamics and propulsion. Now we'll go into some definitions. Trim is the first definition. It's the condition where the summation of the moments about the center of gravity is zero. But to a pilot, trim means achieving zero control forces or the ability to take your hands off the controls as shown in the picture where the pilot in the front seat has their, their hands up in the air. The actual trim control in the aircraft is shown on a stick with the coolie hat or in a small aircraft with the wheel. This is what the, the pilot will move in the aircraft to basically zero out the forces so they can take their hands off. Stability can be defined generally as the sense of the moments generated when the aircraft is displaced from trim. So now we've defined trim, now we can talk about stability. And there's two categories of stability, static stability and dynamic stability. Static stability is the initial tendency to return to trim. Dynamic stability, on the other hand, is how the airplane responds to disturbances over time. Each category, static and dynamic, can be either positive, neutral, or negative. And then static stability it can be further divided into what's called stick-fixed and stick-free stability. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Here's a diagram to show the different static stabilities. On the left is positive static stability. You can see if either the cone on the top is displaced, it will go back to its original condition, or the ball at the bottom, if it's displaced e up either side of the curve, it will go back to its initial trim condition. That's positive static stability. In the middle, we see neutral static stability. The cone at the top, if you move it to one side, it will just stay at that next position and just be happy. Likewise, on the bottom, the ball, if it's on a flat plane and you displace the ball or disturb it from trim, it will stay there and be perfectly happy. On the right, we see negative static stability. If I flip the cone upside down and I tip it, it's going to want to just fall over. Likewise, on the bottom, if I put the ball on top of the curve and then that's the trim condition and then I just disturb it or displace it, the ball is going to roll off to one side or the other and not return back to trim at all. So that's negative static stability. Next, we'll talk about flight control systems. So unpowered flight controls means that we're going to rely on the strength of the pilot and the aerodynamic assistance to move control surfaces. There's no hydraulics. There's no fly-by-wire. A reversible flight control system means that if you move the control, the control stick, it will cause the control surface to move. Or if you move the control surface, it will cause the control stick to move. And Reversible flight control systems are typically what we see in general aviation aircraft. Powered flight controls, on the other hand, rely on hydraulics or electric powered actuators to move the control surfaces. Irreversible flight control systems are ones where you apply a force to the control surface and nothing happens to the stick. Next, we'll talk about stick-fixed versus stick-free. 
Stick fix means the pilot's simply going to hold the control stick and rudder pedals in a fixed position. Stick free, the control stick and rudder pedals are not restrained in a fixed position. Control surfaces of irreversible systems do not float with the air or with the aerodynamics. However, the fuel system should generate control forces similar to the good, a good reversible control system. Because aerodynamic forces are capable of moving the control surfaces, it is characteristic for stick-free systems to be less stable and stick-fixed. Reversible control systems have both stick-fixed and stick-free static stability, whereas irreversible control systems have only stick-fixed stability. When we think of stick-fixed static stability, it's going to be related to control position. When we think of stick-free static stability, it's related to control force. Next, we'll talk about free play, friction force, and breakout force. These are the definitions, and the next slide will show a, a graph or a picture to help illustrate. But free play is basically the controller motion produced by negligible force. It's motion which does not move the surface in flight. So it's kind of the sticker control wheel is kind of flopping around. Friction force is the force required to move the controller through the free play. Breakout force is the force that moves the controller beyond the region of free play and is actually when the start of the control surface movement occurs. Here's some graphs to basically illustrate the difference between friction, free play, and breakout. You can see that if I, with force, zero force, I eventually pull back and there's some friction. The yoke moves, but the, but the control surface does not. So you can see friction, then there's free play, and then eventually the control surface or delta E in this case for elevator eventually moves. The graph on the right shows stick force forward and, and aft, positive or negative, and then how the friction and breakout plays on the control surface deflection. So we talked about static stability. Let's talk about dynamic stability. Dynamic stability is how the airplane behaves with respect to time after it's disturbed from trim. And we'll see that aircraft generally can have a first order dynamic response or a second order dynamic response. And these are three first order dynamic responses. So the upper left graph shows a positive static stability. Its initial tendency is to get back to, to trim. And over time, it's also getting back to trim. So that's both positive static and positive dynamic. On the chart to the upper right, once it's displaced from trim, its initial tendency is away from trim so it has negative static stability, and over time it's also going away from trim. So it has both negative static and negative dynamic stability. On the lower graph, once the system is displaced from trim, it just stays at that same displacement for all time. So it has neutral static and neutral dynamic stability. Next we'll look at a second order dynamic response. Second order systems have some oscillation and some damping. So the, the curve in the upper left shows a positive static and positive dynamic response. So again the system is displaced from trim. Its initial tendency is toward trim. Even though it overshoots it's always wanting to go back toward trim. So its initial tendency is, is positive but then over time it's also returning to trim. The figure on the upper right is positive static stability, but neutral dynamic stability. Interesting. So we displace the system from trim. Its initial tendency is to go back to trim, but it just oscillates with the same amplitude for all time. So it never really achieves trim again. That's why it's neutrally dynamic 
stability but positive static because its initial tendency was toward trim. And finally, in the lower plot, when the system is displaced from trim, its initial tendency is to get back to trim, so it does have positive static stability. However, every oscillation is getting farther and farther, so the system is growing without bound, and it is negative dynamic stability. Finally, we're getting into controllability. The course is called Stability and Control. We've talked about stability. Now we're going to define control. It's the ability of the aircraft to respond to control inputs. In other words, it's the ability to displace the aircraft from trim, not return it to trim, but actually take the aircraft away from trim or displace it from trim. It's really the opposite of stability. So a very controllable aircraft is not very stable, and a very stable aircraft is not very controllable. And so we would expect to have some limit in both. And these limits can be described by looking at the aircraft's center of gravity envelope. This figure shows the relationship of stability control to the CG envelope. The y-axis is aircraft gross weight, and the x-axis is center of gravity in percent mean aerodynamic cord, or inches after datum. And as we go from left to right on the x-axis, we're moving the CG aft. So on the left, you can see the forward CG limit is really set by controllability. It's the ability, again, to have the aircraft respond to control inputs to displace it from trim. So the forward limit is set by controllability. As we look at the right side of the CG envelope, we see the aft limit, which is set by stability. The top horizontal is maximum gross weight, and there's typically a corner or an angle where the structural limit prevents the CG envelope from going outside the upper left portion of the CG envelope. So that's the relationship of stability and control. We call the core stability and control, but sometimes it's better to think of it as stability or control.